So thank you so much again for joining us here in Riga. And um, I'm going to start with uh, the whole purpose of the event that we're attending, the Riga conference. It's mostly a uh, security and foreign policy event, but this year it's mostly about security and collective security in the year after the Russian-Ukrainian war. And uh, um, the basic concern of people here that we lack uh, a kind of understanding and we lack uh, the feeling of security after what happened to Ukraine, to Eastern Ukraine, to Crimea. What do you think, uh, should we try to fix already the system of collective security that basically malfunctioned when it comes to uh, the Ukrainian crisis and or find out some kind of new creative way how to reestablish uh, communal security for the whole region? Well, I think that uh, what we have seen, and you were referring to 2014, mm -hmm. the uh, events, as they started with the illegal annexation of Crimea, then the war in the eastern Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, is actually already the second event that proves that the system as it has been designed uh, post-World War II uh, approved 40 years ago in Helsinki through the final act uh, has malfunctioned. The first thing I always cite as an example is Georgian-Russian war. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually the inability of international organizations, of international community in particular, to stop the aggression, to stop the war, has been actually a good incentive to continue in Ukraine. So we also don't know what else could happen in, let's say, coming years and where it could happen. So from that point of view, uh, we definitely see that the system uh, doesn't work. Uh, I think that what we have to do, uh, still to do our best to restore that international liberal order in Europe that uh, we wanted to build neither Ukraine nor Latvia at that time were independent countries. The Soviet occupation of the Baltic states as well as Ukraine being, being part of Soviet Union did not allow us to be part of the concept of Europe whole and free. But I still think that we should concentrate on the rebuilding of that uh, post-war, post-Cold War liberal international order where we respect territorial integrity, where we respect international law, but also where we get some kind of instruments also of open enforcement. Of course, uh, we use economic sanctions. There is some political uh, instruments. Uh, we all understand that uh, those countries who are not covered by NATO Article 5 are even in greater danger than those countries that are within the NATO. So from that point of view, uh, I still think that uh, uh, the whole effort should be put in restoring or modifying that order, but I really don't think that we would be able to work out something new under the current uh, circumstances with more assertive, more aggressive Russian Federation on one hand, but also there are also some other challengers of the It's true, but it, there, are, there is a lot of discussion about um, re-establishing trust with Russia, for example, or trying to get it back together in a uh, you know, workable mode uh, when it comes to NATO or European structures. But in Baltic states, uh, and I've been traveling in uh, recent uh, week, and I've heard a lot of voices, uh, especially among Baltic uh, states, they say that it's not possible with the current uh, in a uh, current regime in Moscow with their attitude. It's not possible to seek the conversation, seek dialogue anymore. And what we do, we have to do is be not in a defensive mode, but you know, be more proactive. What do you think is there should be still balance trying to seek out to Russia, reach out to Russia, or the, there is lack of unity inside Europe or transatlantic partnership when it comes to a uh, higher stance against what is happening? Uh, no, I think that uh, we have shown remarkable unity so far within the European Union as well as with the United States. Uh, this has been quite remarkable achievement even if sometimes we think that we had to act as the Union, we had to act 
a faster mm -hmm. and probably more active way. But if you have 28 member states, you always get into discussion on everything because there will be always different views and you get um, the decision which is sometimes the lowest common denominator, sometimes just the common denominator, well, very rarely, but also the highest <laughs> common denominator. Uh, with Ukraine, I think we have got uh, the common denominator. It was not the lowest because there were so many countries uh, willing not to let's say, use economic sanctions. Uh, of course, let's still also... The case. Uh, still the case, but uh, even if you hear some uh, great statements uh, before Prime Minister or Foreign Minister of that or another country enters the room, uh, that the sanctions are useless, let's talk, uh, and all those uh, arguments we usually hear from some of countries, still after the discussions, we get the unity on the decision. That's something we should not underestimate. But that's uh, only part of, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, the issue. Uh, about the dialogue with Russia. Look, we haven't stopped the dialogue with Russia. We have Normandy format, where Germany and France is participating, and after every uh, form of dialogue, be it heads of state and government or foreign ministers reporting back to uh, European foreign ministers. We have had the dialogue uh, on, uh, not even dialogue process, on Iranian nuclear program. So mm -hmm. uh, let's face it, it's here. There is no full isolation of Russia and it would be um, impossible to do that. But uh, where I see uh, the difficulty uh, of meaningful engagement, uh, political engagement uh, right now is uh, the something what we were just discussing, the creation probably of new collective security order. Mm -hmm. uh, because you cannot talk about creation of new order uh, with the country that has just did its best to break the existing one. Mm -hmm. uh, where do we have guarantees that uh, the result of discussions, even positive result, uh, would bring also to the implementation of such order. So I think that we have to be rather careful and flexible. We have to talk with Russia in order to uh, bring stability and peace in the east of Ukraine. That's, that's clear. We have a uh, multiple approach here. We will have to deal with the situation of the illegal annexation of Crimea and non-recognition. We all understand that uh, there are some countries that uh, are more than happy to forget about the subject. There are some countries back in the European Union that are actually uh, regularly reminding it. But we also understand that uh, this issue is going to take quite a long time. However, we have already some examples, for instance, the Western non-recognition policy of the occupation of Baltic states took 50 years, a long time, but uh, it has been uh, observed, it has been implemented, and at the end of the day, it proved to be the right policy. I think that we have to be very strict uh, and consistent when it comes to the also policy of non-recognition of, 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 of annexation of Crimea. So here I say that uh, we cannot simply say no talks. In Russia, and we are talking, let's not fool ourselves. Uh, probably we'll be talking uh, on Syria as well very soon. There are already some talks in Vienna, but we are far away from the situation. However, I see also some limitation on, on the talking. But the issue of Crimea is uh, very important here because it's so illustrated for many uh, countries and especially regular people back in the States or in Europe. Crimea still is viewed largely as a local issue has nothing to do with their lives, they're not very interested in dealing with it, they see it as a part of a sphere of influence of Russia or Russian territory. But in the, at the same time, Crimea is a, such a good illustrative example of the, I think, the biggest assault on a system of international law since it was you know, built uh, in the uh, mid 20th century. But because uh, it's very hard to sell this idea to uh, many people abroad that it matters, in, in that case, 
if there is a, you know, a tribalism in the geopolitics, for example, or, or there is no international law, it will hit you back at home with, in so many ways. But still, we're struggling to deliver this message. And Ukraine is very active at this. Baltic states are you know, very loud, despite the size of countries. They're very loud pushing this message uh, back then. But why do you think it's uh, not working out very well and the whole global community is still not convinced that this is not uh, an international crisis, but rather a local conflict? Well, I would, I would disagree. Uh, if we see the... Uh, the result of voting last year in the United Nations General Assembly, mm -hmm. it was very convincing vote of uh, 100 members of the United Nations uh, on the illegal annexation of, of Crimea and condemnation of, of that act. Uh, we all see that uh, in March, on the anniversary of so-called referendum, mm -hmm. we've got uh, also the right statements uh, from the European Union, from many EU, actually all EU member states. Uh, we have seen also that uh, this has been reaffirmed uh, wherever there are visits by presidents, prime ministers, ministers of many countries. When it comes to general public, uh, let's face it, I think that uh, we are living in a situation where um, trouble in the eastern neighborhood of the European Union, in the southern neighborhood of European Union. The whole Syria crisis, migration, uh, development of economy, that you get so many news, so many challenges that uh, unfortunately uh, when you see changing pictures, changing headlines all the time, we tend to focus now on what's happening in Syria, what happened mm -hmm. with the uh, Russian planes that apparently has been uh, uh, attacked by ISIS group. So we, we see so much change of news in this 21st century environment that people really uh, sometimes do not think about uh, uh, one or another issue for a long time. Mm -hmm. If asked, they certainly think that uh, the breach of international law in the 21st century uh, is not something acceptable. At the same time, uh, yes indeed, uh, we have to look at uh, this also from the point of view of governments, that they should probably provide more active, uh, let's say, policy when it comes to uh, giving the right messages, not only to Ukrainian people, but back to, uh, let's say, our own societies. Look, for instance, uh, for instance, uh, in this country, in Latvia, mm -hmm. since the beginning of refugee crisis, uh, we are talking only about uh, refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about uh, Syria, which is the first time when there is some keen interest. I recently visited uh, high school um, in the province of mm -hmm. Latvia and uh, children, well, children, they are already uh, uh, high school uh, uh, people. They, uh, they were asking a lot of questions about Syria, about uh, migration and about Ukraine. So it's not, <laughs> it's not uh, somewhere, you know, in a kind of Disappearing. It's mentality. globalized news world. It's easy. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, at the same time, unfortunately, if uh, if if we see that uh, there are so many challenges and uh, both governments and and people's attention sometimes are shifting, uh, I believe, and that is something that uh, we are doing both here in Latvia as well as uh, when we are talking with our colleagues from the European Union. Uh, union, uh, then we then we remind that uh, while there are so many developments, let's not forget also about uh, uh, the events of 2014, illegal annexation, that Minsk agreements are not implemented, and Ukraine uh, is on the other screen. My last question, not the least important though, is about civil rights battles in uh, Eastern Europe is a part of geopolitics. It's a very important issue uh, that each country struggles in the region very much. 
um, for LGBT community, especially in Eastern Euro uh, Europe, you're um, kind of inspiration or hero in the way that you're one of those um, rare examples of public people being out and uh, supporting the cause. But um, in many countries, we're moving with different uh, speeds when it comes to civil rights equality. There is lack of understanding. There is, uh, for example, spike of violence. The situation got worse in Ukraine the, uh, last year. Uh, there are positive examples like uh, the historic uh, gay pride in Riga this year or in Warsaw. But at the same time, there is a lack of understanding in those societies all around the front line, um, with, you know, thanks to Russia partially why it's important to have a civil rights equality. It's not just about gay people, but uh, equality as per se. How do you think it's uh, possible to sell the message in the right way? And uh, considering the progress that even Latvia uh, went through in the, in the uh, recent couple of years, uh, what could be the universal formula for the region when it comes to pushing for equality? Well, that's the most difficult question <laughs> I, have, I have got in weeks. It's always great to talk about what our response should be to that or another international crisis, but this one is very difficult. Look, uh, the Latvian history and example uh, has been also quite, uh, let's say, symbolic. Uh, you were referring to Europe Pride in June 2015. Mm -hmm. That. Uh, was a peaceful demonstration. Uh, yes, still probably uh, too much police around for security reasons, but uh, I think that uh, our Ministry of Interior and Police Force did uh, uh, their best uh, to ensure that there are no any provocations, and they did a very professional work. But if you compare the first pride in 2005 with violence uh, on the street, uh, a lot reminding, uh, for instance, what happened in that or another capital recently in Tbilisi in 2013. Mm -hmm. Well, I know also that in Kiev there has been quite uh, developments uh, in the past. Uh, so we also had the same. The most negative attitude, the very aggressive crowd, uh, not big one, but still uh, trying to somehow ruin the whole uh, the whole concept of, of pride, the whole concept of uh, uh, civil rights, uh, we are still not uh, able to uh, work out, uh, let's say, the necessary legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, this parliament doesn't have majority on this, but what I have seen that over 10 years the attitude is changing. It's changing slowly, but in order to change it, uh, I think that there is a need to start with uh, some small steps. Uh, first step is uh, the authorities must ensure, first of all, must ensure the right of people to go out on the streets to, to let's say, have their events like rides or, or, or demonstrations. Protected from violence. And uh, those demonstrations have to be protected. We failed miserably 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, two rides were quite uh, quite an event, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, there were also attempts to, by local government, to uh, actually uh, uh, prohibit uh, the uh, the demonstrations, the the pride, and then actually the legal system stepped in. The courts uh, made cru crucial decisions, saying that it's uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Mm -hmm. and those decisions were overturned and the police was instructed uh, to provide necessary security. I attended myself uh, another ride in 2012, which was the local one, again under the very heavy police uh, presence, but already no demonstrators against mm -hmm. uh, eh, one or two crazy people shouting something. Uh, this was already a change, so that's the responsibility, first of all, of the authorities to ensure that such events may take place. People, when they see other people, they start to think that probably, you know, it's nothing, 
terrible. Human beings, in other words. Uh, human beings. Second, uh, yes, uh, there also is an importance of how the news media uh, and uh, journalists are, let's say, um, showing the mm -hmm. events, the coverage. And again, if the coverage is more or less, uh, let's say, unbiased, uh, again, that, that helps. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think that uh, from time to time, and uh, I was not the first one to come out, we have some journalists, some people, as I see that there are some more or less popular people who do not look like, you know, outright criminals and so on, that also helps. Having said that, uh, yes, uh, I'm happy to see the progress. But I also see that my own country has quite a way to go. The legislation on uh, partnership, we are not even talking about marriage because it's prohibited by the constitution to call, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. same gender uh, union as, as, as marriage. And I don't see that we will be able to, let's say, change the constitution anytime mm -hmm. soon. But I think that we are slowly reaching the point where also there is going to be the change of heart in many political forces and uh, in that or another form, most probably next parliament could also adopt the necessary legislation. Uh, I also think that uh, there is an additional, um, how to say, element uh, that helps uh, uh, probably to bring a change uh, to some of countries, uh, Eastern Partnership countries, the candidate countries, uh, and that element is that uh, now equal rights, uh, civil rights issues are being part of EU and partner dialogue, EU and uh, mm -hmm. uh, candidate country dialogue. And there are demands to implement uh, some of necessary uh, legislative acts uh, that uh, are protecting uh, any minorities. That's, uh, that's also very important. However, of course, uh, we see that uh, also Russian propaganda works quite well, defending uh, conservative values, as they call it, uh, that uh, we still have, uh, unfortunately, a situation where um, authorities and politicians are not up to their responsibilities, trying probably even to get uh, some popularity <laughs> Obviously. Uh, which is uh, which is of course uh, unfortunate, but uh, I also see that uh, through the dialogue, through some pressure, that is a little bit changing. But they are absolutely right. There are different speeds, different incentives, uh, and uh, the only thing that I believe can bring the change is also the time and the change of generations uh, because there have been um, the old Soviet uh, groomed generations that have their own views and there are younger generations that are more open and more tolerant. It's logical but I don't want to wait for 30 years to have my equality uh, and it's very hard to explain that. Well, to I'm, I'm rather optimistic that we will <laughs> not wait 30 years. I think that uh, already the example I was just providing, it took, since regaining of independence, it's 25 years. Mm -hmm. Since this kind of, um, um, well, year 2005, the particular year 2005, and to what you've described, you've seen, I believe, your, with your own eyes uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. it's 10 years. Could be quicker, but uh, I also know that uh, Sometimes if you try to push harder, mm -hmm. you get also a bit kind of harder response. So it's a, uh, it's a kind of delicate balance between showing leadership, responsibility, but also trying to engage, engage in dialogue. We'll keep hoping for a snowball effect in this case. Um, thank you so much again for joining us uh, and hope we'll see you again sometime at the Hamatsky International. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you. me.